never going to come. Well, praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise His name forever. Amen. Well, we've had a good time of praise and worship, but now let's let's get into His Word today. I hope everybody brought their Bibles. For you that's watching, I hope that you brought your Bibles so you can follow us today and that you'll be able to know for sure that I'm straight, that I'm giving it to you right. You can follow along in your Bibles and and, uh, and God will open something up for you maybe. Amen? All right, if you would, we're going to chapter 7 again in the book of Romans today. Chapter 7 in the book of Romans. We're going to begin reading in verse 12. We did more or less, you might say, the first half of this chapter uh, last week. And, uh, and I named it, what about the law, because he was focusing so much on the law. But now he's leading to the flesh. And so my title today, for us today, we're going to talk about our flesh. What about the flesh? And so uh, we're going to go and begin reading in chapter 7, verse 12. And if my people uh, will stand as we open up with just the Holy Scriptures here as we begin reading. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 12, and which is sort of an end of the first half about the law. Starting in verse 12, it says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And I know that's kind of hard to grasp that sentence. Everybody, I understand that when you just first read it. We're going to come back to this. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal or fleshly, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not, or understand not, or know not. Another translation. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth that still dwelleth in me. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, and that's what we're, our whole focus today is our flesh. For I know that in me, verse 18, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I love the King James and the way it's worded, and that's almost a tongue twister. Verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me. But I delight in the law of God, after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And then he goes into a whole new perspective of something he wants us to see. And that's what this whole chapter was about, leading us up to chapter eight. And we will cover the first few verses of chapter eight at the end of the message today. But let us go ahead and open up in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we delight. We delight to get into your holy scriptures. Come, Holy Spirit, even this moment. Bring your word alive by your spirit to us today. Do that that only you can do. Reveal the spiritual to us. That we might overcome our flesh. And we thank you for it by faith. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, you almost can't do chapter 7 without a little foundational look at what the Apostle Paul is trying to do when he wrote chapter 7. And, and so we have to go over that a little bit like we did last week and set up a foundation for this chapter. The Apostle Paul made it very clear he's talking to the Jews. Now here's the Apostle Paul that was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You talk about religious. He was religious by the, the law. And all of a sudden now, all these people that knew him, they're looking at him, and here he is saying there's a new gospel. There's, there's this new thing called grace. There's this new thing in which you don't need the law, basically, and, and so on. So, so they're really putting it to him with questions and wondering what he's talking about and how can this be? How can we not look at the law? And how, how about this grace and all this stuff? And so, so what he's done, beginning in chapter 3, he begins laying a foundation leading up to chapter 8 is where he's headed. But he set a foundation. He makes it very clear to the Jews and to them that, that the, everything's the same for the Gentile and for them too. And he uh, lays a foundation of the fact that we're all sinners. If you go look at where he makes it very clear he, that he's talking not only to the Gentiles but to them. I went back and looked and counted. He uses eight verses, mostly from the Psalms. I think the last one or two is from Ezekiel. But he uses eight scriptures as his proof text, you might say, as proof that we're all sinners, that the Bible makes it very clear uh, that the Bible says we're all sinners. This was important. In building his foundation. And then he, then he speaks to them about the law because they had trusted in the Mosaic law and the law of Moses that was given them for their whole lives. They were born under the law and they lived by the law and they believed in the law and they knew that they knew, like you and I know that we know, that Jesus is our Lord. They knew that they knew that Moses was a great prophet and had gotten the law from God and given it to them as a people. And so this was a huge, as I said last week, this was a huge thing for them to accept a new, what they consider a whole new way, which they also believed was coming against the law, like it was saying the law was bad. And so we even read a verse here that, where he's speaking about the law. He's dealt with, with, uh, with the idea that we're all sinners. He's dealt with the idea of, of faith. He, he spends two chapters on faith and Abraham and, and where faith comes in to, to the new covenant. And then he takes time talking about the law, and, and that's where we finished more or less last week. He wants to make it very clear that the law, and that's why we read in verse 12, if we go there right now, he goes to verse 12 and he says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And so he's trying to make it very clear because that was a. You have, we have to be, remember that the Jews. This was, as I said, this was a huge thing. He wants to make it clear to them that the law is good, it's just, and it is righteous. You know, he's not trying to throw out the law as being evil, so to speak, and and wrong because the law was right. And so, this verse and the next couple of verses is completing his argument about the law and how it is still needed to expose sin. So let's read verse 13, because that's what he's speaking of, I think, there. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? In other words, did the law kill me? Because he's talking about he's died with Christ, and, which is language they can't grasp. And he says, so is that which is good, talking about the law, he says, is that, did that made death in, unto me? And he says, God forbid but sin, that it might appear 
sin. There's your purpose of the law. Even today, the purpose of, of, of the law of God is to help us recognize we transgress the law, which is sin before God. And we, we transgress the law, therefore we've sinned. So the law exposed our sin, and this is what we're dealing with. And he wants to get across then what you're really dealing with, and this is Christianity. Jesus deals with sin to its completeness, to fulfillment of it, and the law couldn't do that. And that's what Apostle Paul gets to in chapter 8 a little more. All right, so verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. And that word carnal, when you see it in your translation, could be the word flesh or fleshly. And he, so he says, the, now, he says, for we know that the law is spiritual. Let's stop there. In other words, the law does something spiritual. The law's purpose, I know we, it was written on stone, and I know that you read it on the Ten Commandments on the wall at the courthouse and all, but the law is spiritual. It deals with your heart. It deals with who you are and the inner man and how you uh, live and, and what you believe. And, and it's a spiritual thing. It is the thing that exposes sin. Is sin something you can see on the, the wall of the courthouse like the Ten Commandments? No, you can't see sin. Sin is a spiritual element. It is a spiritual thing. And so he's saying we know the law is spiritual because it's dealing with sin. And then he comes on and he says, but I am carnal or fleshly sold under sin. Now, let me go ahead and deal with this issue here before we read the again and go verse by verse through the scriptures about the flesh that Paul gives us. Um, there is debate among scholars about whether when he's talking about the flesh in this text in chapter 7 is that before Paul was a Christian or is it after Paul was a Christian I mean I spent half a day reading commentaries of different commentaries and I found that you could flip a coin didn't matter if it was Pentecostal or not Pentecostal. You could flip a coin. Uh, one uh, Pentecostal that I have a lot of respect for believed it different from what I believe. And then others agreed with what I feel and so on. So I want you to know there is a debate here. But, <clears throat> but uh, And then some would say, well, what's it matter? And I thought about that for a while. I thought, does it matter? It's describing the human being that has a nature that, you know, you know and I know that it describes us as human beings. This thing about I do what I don't want to do sometimes and I, I you know, I know I shouldn't have done that. I didn't want to do that. And you and I both know that, 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 that it describes us, even as Christians. And so I want you to know, though, what... I feel here because I feel like I've seen it, so to speak. I had a revelation with this verse right here, and the Lord just opened it up with me. But I want you to know this is the second time that God has confirmed to me. And, and so, you know, it's one of those things that I'd put in the bank, you might say, that I say and believe what I believe is true as far as their argument of whether it was before salvation or after salvation. I've had two confirmations with Revelation that this was... He, Paul, Apostle Paul, when he's talking about the flesh, there is no good thing in my flesh. He's talking about now, after his Christianity. He's not talking about before Christianity, although it applies, doesn't it? That, that still applies to the humanity of a person before humanity. I mean, before salvation. But I would tell you that I'm 99... 0.999% in my heart and in my mind, just so you'll know the stance here, is I believe he's talking about our Christian walk. If not, think about this too. 
If not, why should we even be spending time looking at this? Are we trying to study what people are like before they're Christians? Is that all Paul wanted to do? Of course not. He was talking to the Jew about humanity, and it does deal with that. But also, you and I both know that it also applies to me and to you, even in our Christian walk. And so, uh, and so let's move on from there. But I read this verse 14. For Let's go back to that. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold under sin. And I, uh, I had this thing just come alive to me this week, and I, I can't spend the time. I'm not planning on spending the time on this message to go over the stuff that he ended up revealing to me, and I've been thinking about it ever since. But, but what it did do is it connected me with this verse that I've never been connected with, and that was the second half of this. But I am fleshly, sold under sin. I just want to tell you, I've read the commentaries over and over and over through the years, and I've looked at this verse, and I could not connect, for whatever the reason, just for me, you may have already seen what the Lord, you know, pointed out to me in this verse. But sold under sin, he's talking about when he was lost under sin. Jesus Christ died on that cross, and he purchased us. He was sold he was redeemed is the word we think of as Christians. While he was under sin, he was redeemed. He was sold back to Jesus. Jesus bought him back, and we now belong to Jesus. Now, let's get across this spiritual point. And I, I focused on it big last week, and I need to focus on it today because this is the most important thing of all. We must understand that one day, there's a judgment day, and either you're one or the other. If you are a non-believer, if you are lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, if you, do, or if you are not born again, let's make that very clear. Jesus made it very clear. He says you must be born again. Let's make that very clear. So judgment time, you're either born again and under, you're either not born again if you're a non-believer, and, and I put my hand over my head here, you're under you're dominated when you're a non-believer. It, sin in your flesh has dominion over you. You are under it and you are judged by the law. Paul uses that wording, under the law. You'll be judged under the law and so on. And, and that we're not now, as Christians, under that law when it comes to the day of salvation. And so I want you to understand, either you are born again and you're no, no longer going to be judged from under the law, but under what? Under grace, under mercy, under the love of God. And so this verse here, what he's talking about in the second part, what I believe he showed me, which now I feel connected with, and I never did as I read this, and so many times I've read this. He's talking about while he was under sin, he was sold, and he was bought back, he was sold to Jesus, he was given. We were given to Jesus. When Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, he purchased us, and the Father had given us to him. We were bought. Jesus paid a price, and so now we're under grace and not under the law. And so that's what he's talking about here. So now he finishes up with the law, and uh, and let us read this description. These these uh, verses are are just an amazing way it's written. Of course, I'm reading it in the King James and. Maybe that's a little tough for us, but you know, it's, it's just got, uh, it's, it's simple in its totality. Basically, before I read it and go through each one and make some comments, basically I find myself, as we said earlier, I find myself doing things I wish I didn't do. I may have said something I shouldn't have said. I may have wished I, wish I hadn't watched that thing that I watched, maybe on TV or something or a movie, and shouldn't have watched that thing. Or I shouldn't have gone someplace that I knew I shouldn't have gone. Or I shouldn't have got ugly and angry and said those things to somebody that I shouldn't have said. We all find ourselves doing that, that in our hearts, we, we wish we hadn't have done it. And we wish we could take it back. We find that in our flesh, basically, this is what the whole thing that we're going to read here in general is what it's saying. The law is still part of the human nature. The flesh is 
under the law. The flesh is. Now, I'm not in the law because I've been bought by Jesus Christ, redeemed by Him, and He's brought me out from under the flesh. It's still my flesh, but He's brought me out from under the flesh. And I'm no longer under that when it comes to Judgment Day. All right, now let us go to the and read this wonderful flesh that we have and see what He tells us. Okay, in verse 16 or 15, he's for, He says, For that which I do, I understand not allow not i know not for what i would that do i not but what i hate that do i do i really need to go into that anymore it's basically what i said before it's even things he hates he says i find myself doing them when i don't want to do them okay verse 16 if then i do that which i would not i consent or i agree with the law that is good. Now why did Paul say this? Again, he's, been, he's talking to the Jews about the law and he's wanting them to know, even though he's given them this new way to God, he's wanting them to know that this thing that, that he's saying, that when he, all this stuff he's saying agrees with the law. In other words, the law says I shouldn't have done that, and that's what I know in my heart I shouldn't have done. I shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have gone there, shouldn't have done that, should have done this and didn't do it, and so on. All that agrees with the law, because the law is the one that, that, that shows us that we've missed the mark, which we call the definition, the, the basic definition of sin. It, it, when, when, we, when he says this stuff, he's saying I agree with the law. We're back to that issue that he's wanting the Jews to understand he still is not saying the law is not good. It is still a good law. The law is still good. Verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. What a powerful statement. I'm a Christian and I've got flesh that's under the law, but I'm not under it. But I find myself doing that that I don't want to do. I even hate what I did. Something in me, you know, led me to follow my flesh, which is under the law. And he says, it's not I then that did it. If I didn't want to do it, then sin made me do it. Now, that's a difficult one. People say, well, then I have an excuse. No, you don't. Paul addresses all the excuses. Now you have victory through Jesus Christ. You know in your heart it's not right to do it. You have power not to do it. You have no excuse. And, and can't say, well, the sin in me did it. Yes, it, he's saying the sin caused him to do it. But you still have no excuse and you need to repent when you do follow the flesh and get into the things that you hate and you know that transgresses the law. And so he didn't give him an excuse. He doesn't give us an excuse because he addresses that. You know, we'd have to go through the whole New Testament where he addresses that in the different letters. Uh, uh, sh you know, we're made free from sin. Should we sh sin? And, and he addressed that in the first part of Romans. Uh, we've got grace. Well, yeah, well, shall we sin so we can get more grace? Well, and he says, God forbid. You know, how can we who are not under that law anymore go back and sin more? And, and so he addresses all that. So... That verse is taken by itself. Someone could say, well, I've got an excuse. And you don't have an excuse. Paul doesn't give you a loophole, and that's what the world looks for is a loophole. I can live any way I want, and Paul isn't letting that, that happen in, our, in what he explains to us. All right, so let us go to verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Wow. No good thing. You remember a man came to Jesus and says, Good master. He says, Why do you call me good? You know. He had some understanding of who he was, is why he called him good. But there's no good thing in the flesh. The apostle Paul we're talking about here. And he comes back in 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 the in verse twenty four. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of, of death that I have? In my flesh is no good thing. Now, I think it's very important that you and I understand this. And, and so let me say something just as an addition to 
the basics of this that we, we should understand. For you parents out there that you have children, you need to understand this when you raise your children. You know, you, I've heard parents say, and, oh yeah, but I trust my, my, my son or my daughter, you know. They, they want to go away for a weekend somewhere at a party. And you, oh, but I trust my son and daughter. Oh, brothers and sisters, we need to understand. You may trust them because you love them, you know they're loyal to you and all that, but they're not an adult. If you have trouble not transgressing the law, how much more will your young teenage daughter or son have trouble overcoming flesh? If you as an adult do, how much more do they have problems? So I just want to address those that have children. Understand, you may trust them and you love them, but you don't let them have a free reign because they're, they're exactly what they are. They're human beings and they're young, unexperienced, and young with hormones running and the whole issue we know of our children and our teenage daughters and sons. And so you have to put a guard around them. You have to put some laws there. You have, to, in fact, uh, I wouldn't let them go a weekend somewhere with a bunch of kids, you know. And there's maybe there's going to be one adult chaperone and there's 50 kids. Give me a break. You don't think they're going to have a party when he's not around them or he's sleeping or whatever. And so I just want you to know we need to recognize that in the flesh, this is what the point is, in the flesh, in our humanity, there's no good thing. And our flesh falls into traps, even as adults, falls into some evil and things going on. We know that in the church, don't we? In the church we see where even pastors fall into traps and we see it in the headlines, you know? And so we need to recognize with our children, I just wanted to add that to those that may have children today, that, that you need to remember that when you're thinking of your children. They are human, they have flesh, and the, they'll find themselves doing something that they know they shouldn't do because they're human. And their flesh is just like your flesh. Okay, let's go to... Uh, <clears throat> finish verse 18 he says for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good I find not all right it's basically what I've been saying right but let me give you a scriptural example Jesus takes Peter James and John to the garden right there at the end of uh, when he's about to be crucified and soon and and he takes them to the garden to to support him because he's about to go through the crucifixion. And he leaves them there a, a little bit and it says he went a stone's throw to, to pray and he, he left them there and he said, pray for me. Is basically, it didn't say that in scripture, but, but, but he, uh, well, it may have said that he told them to pray, but, but he told them to pray. And he goes off and he prays and he's, in, he's struggling. He's going to go through some one of the, the worst things that any human being, it is the worst thing that any human being can go to because he was pure, righteous, holy, and he was going to take sin upon him, and he's, he's fighting this. And he leaves his disciples there. You know the story. And he comes back, and what happened to them? They've gone to sleep. And he did this three, three times. In Matthew 26, 41, Jesus says this to them. He did say, so this is exactly, I should have remembered this this way, but watch and pray, he said, that you enter not into temptation. Listen to this. Here it is. The spirit indeed or truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. So here we have a Peter, James, and John, the great apostles that, that began the church we have here three of the greatest men that walked with the Lord, which we know the most about in Scripture and the Gospels. And he left them there and they fell asleep. Every time he came back on three times, they had fallen asleep. And here was his comment, the spirit indeed is willing. In other words, it's the same with you and me. Our spirit is willing to do what's right. Our spirit is willing to keep the scriptures. Our, our, our spirit is willing, for example, to be ambassadors like we're supposed to be, but we fail so often, don't we, to be the ambassadors we should be. Our, our spirit is willing. But what we need to understand about flesh today, our flesh is weak. 
If the flesh could have kept the law, the Apostle Paul says, we, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. We cannot keep the law. We cannot keep perfection. We cannot do even all those things we want to do because our flesh is weak and our flesh has a dominion of it is sin. Until we are brought out from under the law to where we have the power to overcome that weakness of the flesh. And so we see there where he asked them to pray, they fell asleep, and he makes the statement, which is the best expression you're going to get, really. Inside our spirits, we're willing, but our flesh is weak and can't always fulfill that that we know we need to do. Verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We've already talked about that. The flesh is under the dominion, and he talks about that in earlier verses in chapter 6. The flesh is under the dominion of the old nature, sin. So when a person is lost, they're completely controlled by their old nature, that sin nature, because they're under it. I put my hand over here. Remember, for judgment, if you're not saved, you're under that dominion of sin. And so far, you'll be judged as a sinner. And, uh, and so the spirit of man, the soul of man, the person, you, you, the, the, the person, until you get saved, are under the dominion and the power of the sin nature of the flesh. We need to understand that. Then when you get saved, now you still have flesh, the sin nature is still working. It's not your nature, though. You see, there's one of the arguments against, against uh, Paul uh, being converted or not converted. He, said, he says it can't be after his conversion because you can't have two natures. Well, you don't have two natures. When you get saved, you still got the nature. You're in Christ. You've got the nature of Christ in your heart and in your spirit. The old flesh is still under the sin nature. That flesh is yours, but the sin doesn't belong to you. You've been set free from the sin nature. All right, next verse. Verse 21, I find then a law. Let's rephrase that. I find then a principle. Help us understand that. I find a, a law, a principle, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And he's talking as a Christian here. I delight in the new law that I've been given in my heart, in my conscience, and in the Spirit of God. I delight in that. Then verse 23 comes. But I see another law. In my members, and members, he's, he's talking about your hands, your arms, your legs, where you go, what you see, what you hear, what you, what, you, know, what, what, what you put yourself into as a human being, and what you say or don't say. He says, I find in my members another law, warring against the law of my mind, and bring me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. So he finds this principle is strong. It happens all the time. Then he comes back with, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he thanks God that for Jesus Christ, who does deliver us from this thing. Let me also say this. I, I truly believe that one of our problems as human beings, I, I believe it is for me as well and for all of us. I, I think this is just, if you want to call this a principle, I'm going to add a principle here. Uh, I truly believe that we as human beings don't recognize and don't think about, because we just don't think about it, or not aware of and truly grasp how wretched our flesh, flesh is. I really don't think we get it so often. That's why we are able, Satan is able to trick us and get us to fall into the traps because we, we have yet to possibly recognize how pitiful, if you want to use that word, that we are. And if you want to know how pitiful man can be in general, now this wasn't for the Apostle Paul. He wasn't into this stuff. But God surely has revealed to all of us by now how evil people can be. I mean, we can just look at our society right now. We can look at the corruptness of politicians. 
We can look at the riots going on right now, the evil of it and the wicked people dying, people breaking and stealing and cussing and doing all kinds of stuff. Stuff's going on in these riots, unlawful against authority. All this stuff going on, the stuff we read on Facebook and and all this stuff we see that's posted about things going on in our culture. Do we see how wretched man can be? And I, I really truly believe that that, that that is one thing that you and I should understand. How wretched can we be? Well, we've all got different backgrounds, and so we might have been taught differently, and there's some things none of us would probably do, but I truly believe that if God left any person walking this earth, this is just my own opinion, totally to themselves, totally to themselves, without the Spirit of God at all, giving them a conscience, I believe we could all be Hitlers, rapists, adulterers, We could all be drug addicts. We could all be prostitutes. We could all be trapped in some of the worst evils. We could become a Hitler. We could become a a Mussolini. We could become some evil person. I truly believe God reveals to us, or we should see it, how evil human beings can become. Just go to our jails and look at all the prisoners and look at all the ones on death row, those that have killed people, murdered people, and raped people, and, and people that have come just become evil. That's how wretched the flesh can be. Now the Apostle Paul, I, I believe here, Apostle Paul, I don't believe he was into any of this bad stuff that I just mentioned. I don't believe he had any of that problem at all. I don't believe he was in, you know, they didn't have the pornography on the internet like they have now. They 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 didn't have uh, easy prescription drugs all over like they've got now where people get addicted uh, or on the street drugs or whatever. They didn't have all that during the day of the Apostle Paul. I believe he was so sensitive and so desiring to be the perfect Christian that God had called him to be. He had so much knowledge, so much wisdom. Peter says... He says a lot of things scripturally and spiritually that that I don't even understand, Peter more or less said. And he was so spiritually in tune, so spiritually sensitive, and and were to become that way, I believe. There's times when I may have said something, didn't say it bad, didn't say it ugly, and, and and I catch myself recognize, well, I probably shouldn't have said that. I think that's the sensitivity. The more you mature, the more you grow, the more you get filled with the Spirit of God, I believe you'll have a sensitivity, and I believe... That's what Paul had. He had a a sensitivity at the utmost highest, you might say, with his walk with God. And so the least thing he hated, he hated, he used the word I hated that I did that or said that or whatever he found himself doing or whatever he was thinking about when he wrote this scripture. So I don't believe it was some big thing. I believe he was just so sensitive, and that's where we're to be. We should be mad at ourselves when we give in to flesh. Mad at Satan. Mad at our flesh. Mad at the sin nature of the old man that we fell into the trap. We should be mad at those things, even when they're little things. It should upset us. We should be so sensitive, I believe, to the little things as we grow in the Lord that we would feel the same way, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank you, Jesus, for delivering me. Amen. All right, now I want to go to a text, and I don't want to stretch this message out any longer than it has to be, but but now... You have to say, well, how does all this work? How does it work in your life? How does this thing work in my life? And I want to go to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to go to verse 16, 17, and 18. Because the Apostle Paul deals with this issue in Galatians. So while you're turning there, how does the passions of flesh, that sin nature... How does it work in our lives, in human beings' lives, in Christians' lives? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Listen closely. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, lust is another word for passion in the King James. So this I say then, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the passions of the flesh. So it's not necessarily sexual is what I'm getting at here. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the passions of the flesh. 
Now he's going to finish explaining that even better, but basically all he's saying is if you're in Christ, truly born again and filled with the Spirit in particular, and you're in Christ, then you do not have to fulfill the old law, the old sin nature. You do not have to give in to that. You have victory over. Here's the way it works, verse 17. He says, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other. Okay, let's stop there. And so what he's saying, he says, You've got flesh over here fighting you. And then you've got that old sin nature and it's trying to trick you and get your mind focused on it instead of walking with God and being led by His Spirit. It's trying to draw you in. And he says, if you'll be led by the Spirit, which is wars against it, he says, if you'll follow the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit that God's given you when you were born again, if you'll follow the Spirit of Christ who never sinned, it wars against that old fleshly nature. And if you'll follow it, you won't do the other. Basically is what he's saying. He says there's a warfare going on, a battle going on. Now it's not two natures. That's the I know there's some through the theologians and arguments in some denominations, there's that argument of the white dog fighting the black dog, I've heard it said, or the, the evil fighting the good and the two natures. And how can a Christian have two natures? They do not have two natures. The flesh has its nature of sin. It's under the law still. You've been brought out from that. You have the nature of Christ if you're born again. And so those feelings you have, I can't do that, I'm a Christian. Those feelings and thoughts you have, I, I know I shouldn't do those things or these things and all because I'm a Christian. That's the Spirit of God working in you, which is contrary, and that's what he says here, contrary to the fleshly desires and passions Maybe some old stuff in your life that you're dealing with and, and you're still trying to get totally 100% free and fighting it. It's a warfare going on. Now listen why. He tells you why at the end of the chapter. They're contrary one to the other. Verse 17, I'm sorry, not the chapter. He said, so that. Did you hear that? So that. In other words, God has given you the spirit to war and be contrary to the old flesh that you used to be under dominion of, He's giving you that Spirit so that. I mean, that's God purposely did this. And I could show you some other scriptures where He, he talks about the creature was put under vanity, not willingly, but because God desired it. It's, it's His plan that we're in the earthen vessels that, that He will get the glory instead of us, you know? It's, it's God's plan that we be in these earthen vessels. But his plan is, he's given us a spirit that we can overcome. And let's look at the rest of the verse. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Did you know, if you're a Christian, especially if you've been walking in this thing a while, did you know there's things that where you were headed toward that you could never go to again because you have the Spirit of God in you? He gave you the Spirit of God so you wouldn't keep going down that old road that you knew you shouldn't be going down. He gave you that spirit for that purpose. The way we reveal to people we're Christians is we're not like them. You know? The reason people know we're Christians is because we say good things. So we, we share the gospel. We tell them we love them. And we show them a love that they wouldn't have got from us if we hadn't been saved. And, and they, they know that, that and they see it. And, and the reason God gave us that spirit is so we can overcome the flesh. And we be not like the world. That we not become like the world. And we show them that Christianity is real. That Jesus is a living God. He's a real God. Alright, so let me just finish that verse real quick again. He gave you... A spirit that's contrary to the lust of the flesh, so that you cannot do the things that you would, and I'll just add to that, have done, or would do. In the last part, the last verse, 18, but if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Oh, there's a a lot of thought that could go into that verse. Let's keep it simple. First of all, if you're not, you're not under the law, 
as far as judgment goes, but when you give into the flesh, guess what? When you get into the flesh, you're going to feel guilty. When you do something you shouldn't have done, you're going to feel guilty. Why? Because you've, 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 you've gone back under the law, not for salvation, I'm not talking about salvation, but you've gone back under the law and you've done something you know you shouldn't have done and you know the law says you shouldn't have done that, right? We wonder why we don't have the peace we should have. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We wonder sometimes, why don't I have the peace that I should have, Lord? And there's a good chance, I'm just, just saying, there's a good chance we're walking worldly, putting ourselves back under the dominion of flesh and doing things that we want to do for pleasure or for ourselves, and we put ourselves back in that place that we feel condemned. We feel guilty. Because in the flesh is nothing but anti-Christ spirit to rebel, to do our thing instead of God's thing, to walk the way we want to do instead of what God wants to do. And that was the whole issue in the Old Testament. He shows us over and over and over. He tells them, you've got stubborn hearts. You keep wanting to do your thing instead of doing what I told you to do. And so if you don't have peace, there's a good chance you're just, maybe you haven't done some big sin. You know, I'm not saying that. But there's a good chance that you're just walking worldly. And if you truly are born again and a Christian, you've got the Spirit of God in you, and you've gone and you're doing stuff that you know in your heart, it's written there, and it's contrary to the things of God, there's no way God's going to allow you to feel peace. You know how you can feel, oh, peace, peace, wonderful peace. And I love that peace and that feeling of peace. But we need to watch ourselves and recognize that that is, uh, I think I used it even in the terminology last week, it's really a good GPS for you and me. If I don't have peace, then something's wrong. If I'm in Christ, something's wrong and I need to take a look at it. Am I walking worldly? Am I walking contrary to the Bible? Am I not doing what he told me to do? Or, or did I keep doing that when he told me not to do it? Or, and then we lose our peace. Why? We put ourselves under the law, which condemns us. And if you live that way, your whole walk, where you're trying to please yourself instead of God, then you need to question your Christianity. That's why he gave you the Spirit, he says. So you can't do the things that you would. And so it becomes a, a checklist, you might say. And, and I'm not talking about works. I'm just talking about if you live totally for yourself and not for God, you and you don't have peace, you need to question yourself. If you're not living for God, you need to question yourself. Are you really a Christian? Have you truly repented of your sins? Are you truly born again? And so I'm going to pretty much finish it there, but we need to recognize how sinful the, the nature of flesh is. Uh, I was going to read the chapter 8, of the first 11 verses or so of chapter 8 of Romans. I'm not going to do that. But, uh, but I want to read a couple of scriptures, and two of them are found in that, those group of verses about the flesh. In Romans 6, 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or the weakness of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, we're talking about our hands, our legs, where we go, what we see, what we do, and so on. Yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness, you know what a yield sign is. He's saying, yield yourself to the Spirit of God like you used to yield yourself to the dominion of the flesh, the sin, when you were lost. Yield yourself to God. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. He's talking about the lost person there. For they that are after the flesh those that live for flesh, those that live for pleasure, those that do what they want to do. And their, the morals will be all different. It depends on how you were raised and, and so on in your culture. But, but, but he's saying those that live after the flesh, in other words, they follow the things the flesh wants to do. I can do what I want to do. I, I'm myself, me, my, me and myself, and I can do whatever I want to do. Nobody can tell me what to do. And I want to do this, and I'm going to do that. And they just follow the things of the flesh. He says that's what lost people do. They sin. 
And he says, but they that are after the Spirit, are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, he says, you're not going to be like the guy that follows the flesh. You're going to be a person that follows the Spirit. Now let me read the whole sentence again. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In other words, again, you have to look at yourself and examine yourself. Because this statement is really a, a, a factual statement. If you're lost, you're going to follow the flesh. If you're saved, you will try to follow the Spirit. If you're truly born again. Last verse, Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And here's a, a statement that is powerful. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. In other words, if you do not have the Spirit of God, if you are not born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, forgiven for your sins, know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you're nothing, no part. You have no part in God. There's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ for your salvation and for life. Well, he's leading up to the fact of knowing all this about your flesh. He says, I want you to know if you're not under the law. He says, I want you to know there is therefore now no condemnation, no guilt for those that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, it's kind of rough reading those things. He read about how terrible our flesh is, and that's what I've talked about this morning. We need to recognize how weak our flesh is. None of us are above falling into flesh at times. That's what the Paul was talking about. He was our extreme example. But he's saying the good news is, hallelujah, the good news is there's no con therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That's the good news, church. So are you under the law? That's the question. Are you under the law, the dominion of the law, where you will stand at judgment day as a sinner? Or have you repented of your sins, turned to Jesus Christ, and been born again and washed in the blood of Jesus and walking not under the law, but walking after the Spirit so that at judgment day you'll receive grace and mercy because we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So I leave that with you. What about the flesh? Oh, wretched man that I am. The good news, who shall deliver me? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Jesus has made me free. I hope that he's made you free too. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Holy Spirit, that's a mouthful. I've said so much about the evil of flesh. But Lord, more importantly, Lord, we need to recognize the need for salvation, the seriousness of salvation, and that we're going to be judged one or the other under the law or under Jesus, under grace. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to be led by your Spirit. That's, that's the call of this message, really. Help us, Lord to be led by your spirit, that we not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we thank you by faith in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. For my people, if you want prayer, just come to the front and, and we'll pray with you. And, and uh, for you that's watching, if you have a question about any of this stuff, just put a note on there or message me on Facebook. But uh, may God bless.